Look, I know I just made a video talking about how I want to see other RPGs, but you know what they say. Gig is a gig is a gig is a gig. Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Chappie, and today we're going to be talking about the biggest source book to hit the D&D scene since a giant paranoid eyebrain monster made a guide to everything so that he could one-up a single fantasy Yelp reviewer. I'm going to go over each chapter in Tasha's Culture of Everything and give a brief rundown of their features to help you decide whether or not you want to buy the book. Now, a word of warning, this video is not going to cover all the subclasses stewing in that cauldron. That is going to have to come in another video video, because holy hot damn is there a lot of stuff to talk about in Tasha's. I can't pretend to know how 31 subclasses work when I get one day to write a script and then three days to give Emma anxiety. And I want my information to be accurate, so pretty much every section in Tasha's book will probably get its own video. There's just that much good stuff. But as always remember that the majority of this is just my opinion, so if you feel like my cooking skills are subpar, then feel free to stew your cauldron however you want. But with that out of the way, let's begin. So you open the book, and the first section you're greeted with after the fluffy introduction is the new class feature features list, and like I said before, there are 31 subclasses in this book. So if you're just here to update your Critical Role OC, you can buy this book just for that. To break it down, Chapter 1 comes with 22 completely new subclass options, plus all of the subclasses presented in the old one-off MTG source books, Ravnica and Theros, and it reprints the Artificer from the Eberron source book with an additional subclass to boot. So if you were looking to buy any of those source books just for their class options, save your money and buy this book. Especially since, in addition to the subclasses, we also get new base class features. Features, the first of their kind since the beginning of the game, that can be freely given to your player either to specifically boost their power or to be gifted out as a reward for excellent gameplay. Except for the Ranger. The Ranger has to replace their old features with new features, because God forbid the Ranger get a break. Looking over these features, they seem to largely be quality of life improvements such as new rules for swapping out your spells and cantrips, new fighting styles and ways to get spell slots back, and an incredibly well thought out variant to racial ability score modifiers that boils down to, hey, just put them somewhere else if you don't like them there, you dummy. There's also simple rules for changing your skills and subclass mid-campaign, and there's even a basic template for creating your own race that leaves a lot to be desired. All these variant rules will either be well-received like feats, or end up ignored completely and forgotten about in favor of, ooh, subclasses. And speaking of feats, the last bit of Chapter 1 provides us with a whole load of new feats, most of which, like the subclasses, we've seen in Unearthed Arcanas, but hey, it's great that they're being officialized. We get feats that buff up martial capabilities, we get feats that steal the gimmicks from other classes, we get the telepathic and telekinetic feats, and we get the chef feat! It has happened! The chef feat exists! Ravioli Stromboli, Wizard of the Cannoli, it is time for you to shine! In the next chapter, Tasha's reintroduces us to the concept of group patrons, an idea originally presented in the Eberron source book, but given new life here by fleshing out the benefits of trying out the concept, and being more generalized so everything's not Eberron specific. I've always really liked group patrons ever since I read about them in Eberron, but the real benefit to this section is that it inadvertently gives new DMs a huge advantage when coming up with concepts for their adventures. There are eight patron types with about six different variations on those types, and new DMs can use these patrons as a built-in plot device with which to relay information to the party, or or they can forego having the party interact with the patron and just use it as the backdrop for a setting. For instance, you could take the Academy patron, set it in a boarding school option, and run a semi-realistic, semi-slice-of-life fantasy story with likable side characters that make up for the boring main characters. And boom! You got Life is Strange, but with wizard hats. It also comes with contacts, perks for being with them, roles for your characters or NPCs to take within the faction, and sample quest snippets to give you an idea of what daily life is like with this patron. Really, a better term for this section would have been factions, but I guess the word carries a negative connotation, so we're trying to trick you with patrons. Support me on Factreon. Also, there's a drawing of wizardly boyfriends, and if I didn't mention it, sexy Neville Longbottom would break my legs. The third chapter consists of magic and magic accessories, giving new spells, reprinting the old ones, and making me shudder at the thought of doing another spell guide. For the most part, the spells consist of the elemental evil spells, a bunch of the intelligence-based spells that we've seen in past UAs, and a few new spells that, for the most part, add flavor to the world of magic. One spell in particular is called the Dream of the Blue Veil, which puts all the targets to sleep as they dream of another world on the material plane, like Eberron, Faerun, or Ravnica. There's no way that a player is going to make use of the spell, but I like that the spell exists so that NPCs can be utilized in a more fantastical way. The chapter also pushes people to give more thought into the role-playing aspect of your spells by giving a list of thematic ways for you to style your magic, by adding sensory effects that don't actually change anything, but help to make your spellcaster feel more like they're yours. The other half of the magic section is dedicated to magic items, and holy hell are there a lot of new magic items! From multiple magic books to cauldrons and cookware that'll make your chef characters scream, 
game. To screwdrivers so good, they'll make your artificer magic better. Every item feels a lot more mystical than usual. I don't know how to explain it. Maybe because it's the first new selection of magic items in a while, but everything feels like something that you'd find inside of a witch's hut. Fitting for it being Tasha's book. But the most interesting items by far are the many magical tattoo options that the players get, letting them prick themselves with a needle and gain supernatural powers, the likes of which only CM Punk can comprehend. Finally, Chapter 4 goes over a bunch of miscellaneous things that the Dungeon Master can use to make their games better, such as rules for sidekick NPCs that travel with the party, teaching the DM how to roleplay monsters so that they might actually negotiate, and an entire section dedicated to puzzles, teaching you how to make them and giving a bunch of sample puzzles for those unimaginative folk. It also throws various random concepts at you, such as natural hazards, supernatural regions, and magical phenomena, all with the purpose of plugging themselves into your games so that you can bring the high fantasy aspects to life. The whole section can help that DM with not enough time on their hands find an idea and just copy-paste it into their own campaigns, and I like that it does that. It's like how Xanathar's gave rules for downtime and tool proficiencies, things that players desperately wanted to understand better, and so Tasha's is trying to do the same thing, but for Dungeon Masters. Overall, if you buy any D&D books this year, buy Tasha's. It stands and will stand as one of the main pillar books like Volo's and Xanathar's Guide, as a must-have for any D&D group that wants to get lost in all the magic. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, hit that like button, and maybe support me on Patreon so that I can help fund better jokes for the person that writes for Tasha. But yeah, Davy out.